Happy New Year from the Deepdale crew. Hope you had a fantastic festive season, however busy or quiet it was, and are enjoying the start of 2024. For this month's Deepdale podcast, we are concentrating on the wildlife and environment of the beautiful North Norfolk coast. A huge thank you to Richard Powell, wildlife advisor, Steve Rowland of the RSPB, and Ollie from One Stop Nature Shop for their contributions. Enjoy the listen and please remember to subscribe and review our podcast in whichever podcast app or directory you use. Enjoy the listen and we begin with the Deepdale podcast theme tune by our hugely talented friend, Jess Morgan. Skies all open wide, geese go high and over. Oh, now you're a beach coma, fist full of sand for sea. So I am on Zoom. I am with a lovely man called Richard Powell, who I have known for a long time. We've sat in many turgid meetings and some very interesting ones as well. And Richard has an incredible pedigree of being involved with wildlife and wildlife projects all over the east of England, really, or probably all over the UK and the world. As this is the Deepdale podcast, we're concentrating on uh, on our part of the world. I think he describes himself as a sort of wildlife advisor. Uh, but he still is neck deep in a huge range of different things and is a fascinating person to chat to about any of the sort of local wildlife geography, that kind of thing. So I thought it'd be really lovely to get him on the podcast and just have a chat with him. And it's really lovely to have you here. Thank you. <laughs> it's a pleasure. And, and, and what, what, what a welcome and an intro. <laughs> I live up to that now. <laughs> You've been heavily involved with you know the creation of many of the kind of the really interesting uh, nature reserves in Norfolk or you know and you, you you know their history you've been involved with all sorts of kind of aspects of of what we sort of take for granted now as our sort of natural economy on the North Norfolk coast and so I think it would just be really interesting to know a bit more about kind of your your history and you know how some of those projects came about. Yeah sure I mean it, there's there's not there's not many nature reserves at all, in, certainly in Norfolk, that I, I ha- either haven't worked on, done management plans for, or certainly fundraised for, or um, certainly walked on. So, um, yes, I know I know the county very well. But uh, as you said in your intro, I looked after the whole of the east of England with the RSPB, but also worked in Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland. So it was fantastic. And Europe. For that matter, I uh, did a lot of work in France and, and a bit in Germany. So it was it's nice to um, to uh, look at that big picture. But it's also really nice to see the sort of results of some of the things you do. And the, the North Norfolk coast is just stunning, as as all your visitors will know when they uh, if they're sort of regular or, or, or first timers, they will see some amazing wildlife on the North Norfolk coast. But yeah. um, my history, crikey. Well, I was well, I was what they call a latchkey kid, I suppose. My mum, uh, my father left when I was two, so um, never really knew my father. So my mother was working, and I was sort of sent out of the house sometimes with sandwiches, sometimes not. And I walked between Yarmouth and Winterton on the beach um, virtually every day in the summer until I was old enough to uh, cycle to the swimming pool where I lived um, uh, after that. But I. I just spent all my time on the beach watching uh, the clouds, watching the tides, watching the, the collecting the stones, collecting uh, beachcomb stuff, uh, oranges and um, uh, 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 sort of um, uh, smooth hound purses and eggs and th- all sorts of things that you would find on the beach as a, as a kid. So that really set my set my world alight, I suppose, for knowing I was going to work in the natural environment from that point onwards, really. And I got to know 
how to look at the clouds and how to know when the weather was going to change because sometimes I got wet, sometimes I didn't. And you uh, you had to learn that. And so landscapes, I suppose, became my passion. You know, the big skies of Norfolk, the big seas, the, you know, the the wind, the air the, and, and the clouds really sort of lit my fire, if you like, um, when I was a, a real youngster. Um, and then, of course, I was lucky enough to do a geology degree. So I, I, I learned about the... Um, the stones that I was picking up, but I also learned about how landscapes were created and, and why they're there and how they operate, um, how the water works, how the how the ecology works. So I've always worked on big pictures. I've always worked on big landscapes. And so it was a real blast to get the job as reserve manager with the RSPB back in in two, well, 900 years ago in 1988. Um, <laughs> and, um, and from that point onwards, I just I just bought land and created nature reserves and had a real blast. When I first started work, of course, you see things like avocets and marsh harriers. Uh, there was um, only about five pairs of marsh harriers in the whole of England, um, or in fact, the whole of the UK when I first started work. And there wasn't things like egrets or um, uh, and avocets were uh, you know, less than 100 pairs in the whole of the UK. So Titchwell um, was incredibly important, not only for, for marsh harriers and uh, and um, uh, avocets, but also, of course, in those days, bitterns as well. And um, when the population is that low, yes, you have to you work with the whole of the, the wardens on the coast uh, to look at uh, look after the eggs during the summer, because there are guys that, you know, and they usually are guys um, that, that like to collect eggs. So we used to sleep out at night and uh, we used to exchange number plates and uh, and sort of information with all the wardens across the whole of the north norfolk coast but yes used to sleep out at night which was fantastic as you can imagine you know uh, and i was in my sort of mid-20s then early 20s so uh, you know sleeping out on the on the west bank uh, in all weathers was 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 just fun really N not really any hassle you know and we we did catch a few eggers and we we used to chase them we worked closely with the police and uh had a few successes and yeah and and of course as you know avocets are just ten a penny now but we don't think about it we don't we don't uh, pay attention to what marsh harriers anymore we just see them um but at that time you know the the, the pair at titchwell was probably the only in north norfolk at that time wow yeah it was, a, it was a different world you know different time how did Titchwell Reserve come about? You know, was it developed over a long, long period or did it kind of happen quite suddenly? Well, it, it, it happened really quite quickly. And in 1975, the piece of land came up for sale. It was a, it was a sugar beet field. It was um, part of a, a larger farm. And um, uh, it came up for sale. And, uh, you know, my predecessors, uh, my, my boss, um, uh, took the advantage to get it because we knew we needed to to preserve land on the North Norfolk coast. It's you always work with farmers and farmers are, are an amazing bunch of people. But sometimes owning the land yourself gives you that whole flexibility to be able to do things that farmers wouldn't want to do because there's no commercial value in in certain ways that you manage for nature. Um, so uh, owning a nature reserve is sometimes much much better because it gives you that that, that ability to then. Uh, create a um, uh, a sponge or, or a springboard, if you like, for for wildlife to then bounce out and go further along the coast. So the RSBB always knew it needed something on the North Norfolk coast. Um, Clyde was just was right down the other end of the coast. We need something bigger and better up this end. And so the RSBB bought the bought the land in seventy five, and the uh, warden was um, uh, over in Birmingham. And literally in those days, you got a phone call to say, get yourself to North Norfolk. Your new reserve is waiting for you. You've got 24 hours to get there. Uh, oh, and by the way, we've just bought a house um, and you'll be living in the village. And uh, away you go. And Norman Sills, is who you may, you may remember, was the was a, uh, one of the older school wardens, a pioneer, uh, an absolute ologist of everything, um, anything small, anything could do scientific. And he was the right person to throw in at the time. And he understood all the the all the invertebrates that were in the mud and, and how to change the, uh, the the landscape to to create. Uh, mud and salt marsh and reed beds and all those mixes of habitats to to create that uh, that wonder of um, uh, of uh, wildlife, but also very much um, the RSBB was keen to make Titchwell one where you could walk up the West Bank and be, you literally be yards from or meters 
from the, from wildlife. And the more that people walk up and down the bank, the more the, the wildlife got used to it, the more you were able to, to identify the birds at, at close call. So Titchwell was always going to be a, a bird a reserve for people to be able to learn as much as for rarities. And that's how it came about. And of course, as you know, you then start to manage for individual invertebrates, which gives you a suite of food, which gives you a suite of birds. And you work for different sets of birds in the winter than you do in the summer. And it becomes a, you know, a, a whole ecosystem that you then have to create. And you've also been involved with the National Trust, am I right in thinking? Yes, I, was, I, I worked for them for, for about 18 months. Yeah, I'm doing some work with them and, as a regional director. Yeah. 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 So you've really kind of seen all all sides of various interconnecting organizations around the coast yes yeah I, i've um and i've always worked in partnerships so, you know one of the one of the great things to to be able to deliver what you need to deliver in a big picture if you're trying to influence a big picture then you can't ever do it yourself you know no one organization is big enough to be able to do to do it all so you have to work with with other people um, and you have to work with people that, you know, aren't necessarily conservationists at times, you know, and uh, so you, you need to be able to dis dispel the myth that uh, that conservation is all about uh, stopping things um, with certain people and uh, others you have to, uh, you, you work with people to, to realise that you occasionally do have to cut things down and you do occasionally have to change habitats and things. So, but you can't do any of that on your own and birds have no sense of boundary. So if, you know, if I just worked at Titchwell, you know, as in the olden days, David Henshelwood and uh, Ron Harold down at uh, Holcomb, you know, the birds would fly between the two. The birds move between Holland and Britain, you know, within a matter of hours. You know, you're, a, you're part of a big picture. So you can't ever do anything on your own, really. It's got to be a partnership, got to be working with other people. Is Titchwell probably your favourite project you've worked on or what would you put that down as? Well, Titchwell was great. I love Titchwell because it was that that way of being able to talk to people and, and really connect with people. So whenever you were at Titchwell, you always had a real mix of avid birders that do nothing, you know, real twitches that are, you know, list people. They, they have to have uh, as many birds as they possibly can in a year, um, which is, you know, which is fine. It's, it's what people do. But you also had families and, and people that just had a general interest in in nature who love to be out in the, in the sky and the sea. Uh, and and working with them was was wonderful. You know, the the, the parting with knowledge and, and just even talking about pond dipping, you know, and talking about invertebrates in pond, you you saw as much joy in the parents' face as you ever did in the children. We used to run pond dipping for adults, you know, because it was always what people wanted to see, you know, because you don't see it every day in your life, you know, these sort of things. So Titchwell is wonderful because it is that real spread of of knowledge and expertise and just a, just a wonderful place to be you know but if i'm if i'm honest yeah it's lake and heath fen which was six you know 500 hectares of carrot fields when i bought it and i turned it into a reed bed and within 10 years had the first cranes for 400 years come to breed in england yeah there's a small population in the broads but these were wild from from sweden and so creating a, a wetland from scratch, I think, is probably one of the things that, yeah, I enjoyed the most, I suppose. But I enjoy all habitats. You see, you know, any landscape is alive, whether it's whether it's a woodland with trees, whether it's salt marsh, whether it's um, reed beds, the sound, the smell, the experience, the, you know, being there at night as well as during the day, being there at dawn, being there at sunset. You just get this amazing connection with nature and it's it's good for your soul. I was very lucky uh, the other day to spend the day on the Haysborough Beach or Happisburg Beach, if you pronounce it incorrectly, with Richard getting very excited about, you know, the uh, the erosion and longshore drift and explaining it all to us and uh, and uh, and also being able to see the uh, the tide bell, which is on the beach there, which was a, a really lovely thing to see. And it was just, yeah, it, you are you come alive when you are uh, you are in the in in the wild talking about wildlife it's just it's wonderful seeing you just get so excited but my 
business partner Chris who often comes on the podcast where it's a bit the same when I ask him about live music or or music generally yeah uh, he just comes alive in a way that yeah and it's the same thing for you whenever I talk uh, whenever I talk with you about wildlife and stuff it's just wonderful <laughs> yeah fantastic so um what's what's sort of your big project at the moment what are you working on at the moment um, well, we're still doing doing some work, you know, on sea defences and flood defence. You know, I, I, I do some work with DEFRA on that uh, all along the North Norfolk coast. Well, the whole of the East Anglian coast is is in a period of change and adaptation. Um, everyone's got to start to look at, uh, you know, doing things slightly different than we were before. Business as usual isn't isn't uh, an option um, with climate change. We, we're all going to have to adapt somehow. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done on that. And that that's really difficult because it's a, it's a really heavy subject, a really hard subject to get your head around uh, climate change and how water will move and change. And it, it works differently on the North Norfolk coast than it does on the, um, on the East Norfolk coast, which works differently than it does on the Suffolk coast. So you have to adapt and change. And I love those sort of challenges. Um, I've just been appointed as the chair of um, the Ancient Tree Forum, actually, for, for the UK. Um, so I'm doing some work. I'm helping them to, to you know, to to look after uh, ancient and veteran trees and uh, and uh, work with um, all sorts of different partners on the management of them because managing ancient and veteran trees is very different from from normal trees. They are they they take a little bit more nurturing, a little bit more care. Um, but some of these things are so six, seven, eight hundred years old. You know, they're, they're again you you just touch the bark and you think of the history that they've seen and and experienced is stunning and um uh we're lucky in in norfolk that uh you know that holcomb and uh, some of the other big estates have a lot of vet veteran and ancient trees and so working with their with their teams to to manage them better and to uh to look after them is is going to be good fun so i only just started that that's a new journey for me um getting into in, into trees and uh, forests so it's it's great everything to do with nature is is just a real blast it, if you if you give yourself some time to immerse yourself in it and just look listen smell and taste sometimes because uh, you stand at titchwell you'll taste the salt of the sea you know all your senses come alive when you're in the, in nature and it does your soul so much good well, it really, really lovely to chat with you, Richard. Thank you so much. And yeah, just a, an absolute joy to hear your enthusiasm about the uh, the natural world, really. And uh, I, I'm, I know a huge number of our listeners and visitors, the reason why they come to North Norfolk is to, is to see the wildlife. But uh, just to sort of hear a bit more about it is fantastic. So thank you so much. That's really kind of you. No, it's a real pleasure. It's always nice to talk about nature. <laughs> I am chatting with Steve Rowlands, who is the area manager for Norfolk and Lincolnshire for the RSPB. Many of you will have visited many RSPB reserves, and some of you probably need to. They're amazing places of wildlife. And Steve, like our other guests on the podcast this month, is an absolute nature buff and loves loves being out there in nature. So welcome to Deep Dell Podcast, Steve. Well, thanks for having me. Lovely to have you on here. I think it's your first time on the podcast, isn't it? It is. It is. I've, I've taken. I don't know about you. I've taken to listening to podcasts over the last um, the last few years. Normally, when you're driving or doing the ironing, they seem to be the two windows in my life where I can make it very clear to it, when I'm ironing to the family, I don't want to be disturbed. Or when you're driving, always, always like a good podcaster. But it's the first time on this one, yeah. Well, welcome. Thank you very much. So, how many reserves are you kind of in charge of? Well, I mean, that, that that's a that's a bouncer of a question to start. I have to add them up. There must be fifteen or sixteen because we've got lots of we've got the big ones like Titchwell and Snettisham, Strumpshaw, Burnie Marshes, Buckingham Marshes, Cantley, over in Lincolnshire, uh, Frampton and Freeston. But then we've got lots of tiny little ones, uh, Rockland Broad and Surlingham Church Marsh as well. So it's fifteen, sixteen reserves. I worked it out the other day. We managed, if you count uh, Braid and Water, which we uh, manage in inverted commas, um, we managed seven and a half percent of the Bulls National Park. Um, so that's quite a quite a chunk of land. I must sit down one day and add up the number of cows we have grazing on our land because it's significant. Um, so uh, not our own. Uh, but, you know, we have graziers come on to do that. So it's an interesting, as you'll know from your background, that that crossover between 
um, the conservation organisations managing land and farmers managing land and that huge overlap where things like cattle management comes in. We're both doing essentially similar things to, to deliver a bit of landscape for wildlife. Do you have a favourite? You know, I know it's like having lots of children. You're not supposed to have a favourite, are you? Uh, you're not. And you certainly don't get pulled into answering that question in a public sort of sphere when someone's <laughs> recording. That would be outrageous. My favourite reserve is the one I'm on at the time on Bear. Because, you know, very, I, very, I very diplomatic. No, not, it's true. I love this landscape. I've lived and worked on the East Coast for most of my career. So for decades rather than years now. And I, I, I love that. I love the East Coast. I love the big skies. I love the marshes. I joked with somebody last year in the Forest of Dean that I found the whole place way too claustrophobic with those hills and trees. It gives you the heebie jeebies. <laughs> And yet you get get people who who aren't used to the kind of the big landscapes that we have here and they step out onto the sort of salt marshes and stuff and they just go, it's, there's nothing here. It's, you know, it's just grey. And then, you know, you get them to stand still for a few minutes and they realise just what an incredible array of, of wildlife is just right there under their footsteps. I, I, I'm known in the RSPB for... Um, winding up my colleagues who manage the uplands at, but it's true our east coast is England's wildest place it's self-willed the tides come and go twice a day you have hundreds of thousands of birds on the east coast flyway that uh, migration route from the arctic down to south africa that stop off on our east coast uh, far more far more wildlife far more variety of wildlife than you find in our uplands and on a winter's day when the wind's howling in, it's just as wild as any hilltop. Uh, it's an incredibly special place. Just outside the swimming pool in Hunstanton this morning, you know, the light over the wash. It's absolutely stunning. So I'll pick a fight with anyone that says the uplands are better than the lowlands when it comes to the East Coast, because they're wrong, and I'm right. And um, it is just an amazing <laughs> place, as, as you know, having sort of grown up up here, and which is why, that's sort of just going off at a slight tangent, uh, you may have heard about the uh, the World Heritage nomination for our East Coast Flyway. So already that's gone past the first hurdle, and the universal outstanding value of England's East Coast wetlands from the Humber to the Thames has been recognised by the UK government. You know, this is a globally important landscape that we're lucky enough to live and work in. And who can't, who can't love that? Would that be a designation then uh, when that kind of goes <laughs> through the next stage? You have release, have you? Uh, no, I have, so, to, I have to say, I've, that's passed no, me by completely. Spending... Right, let's, let's, let's wind Well, this back. is your so opportunity you to explain to to those of us who uh, haven't, haven't noticed it in the news. UNESCO run World Heritage Sites for the United Nations. Yes. And the shorthand for a, a, a World Heritage Site is of outstanding universal value to humanity. And then there are 10 criteria, cultural and natural. And we have put forward with others, uh, England's East Coast um, wetlands, so the, the estuaries from the Humbers to the Thames uh, for nomination. Uh, and that went to DCMS, the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, who open the nominations every 10 years. We put in uh, some paperwork uh, last year before last, last year um, for that. That was accepted. So the government have accepted the outstanding universal value. That's very clear. That's not, not being argued. But now the process takes time. The quickest anyone's gone from that point to UNESCO signing an area off as a World Heritage Site is six years. It can take 20 years because it needs to become now a collaborative process with local communities, local authorities to build up the case and to make sure it can happen. It's not like being designated a site of special scientific interest, which comes with regulation, but you can't have a World Heritage Site if, if there isn't legislation to protect what you're trying to, to, to nominate. So we have sites of special scientific interest, we have special protection areas, etc. So all of that's in place. So that process now starts of having those conversations about how it, how it can uh, to pass that last hurdle. And I would view it more as an Oscar for the landscape and the communities rather than a protective designation. So if you go to the Wadden Sea, which I've been to have a look at, Dutch, German, Danish coastline, um, it's a big thing there. I've, they've had their World Heritage Site for a number of years. Uh, it's, it's helped to protect that landscape, but also to drive tourism. Uh, and there's always that balancing act, I know, between people loving a place to death 
and a place being protected. So we've got all of that to think about. I've just been to South Korea to look at the Korean Tidal Flats. Uh, they've just had their World Heritage nomination. Uh, there's two years now for their first phase. Again, instrumental in helping to drive the, both the protection of the landscape, but also the, 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 the national pride they've got in what they call the get ball, the intertidal flats. So we're on that journey. Uh, it'll take a long time. It can't be rushed. It can't be imposed on people. Uh, it's really exciting, but it's a long process, uh, but it's one that recognises this is an amazing place. It's a place that's evolving, climate change, etc. There will be changes to the coast. We know that, um, but it ought to remain a place that's rich in wildlife and provides jobs in fishing and tourism and, and all the rest of it. We are only as good as the environment we sit in. On the whole, our customers are coming and just wanting to enjoy the incredible space and the incredible landscape and and not necessarily be a bird watcher with a with a list but a you know a bird watcher in terms of oh wow isn't that beautiful the way that that's kind of here and we've got a project over at Heacham uh, plovers in peril so you'll know the ring plovers they nest on the beaches we've lost 80 percent of Norfolk's nesting ring plovers in the last 40 years so they're in dire need of some work. Over the last three springs and summers, we have had volunteers and staff on the beach at Heacham, you know, supported by Wild Ken Hill, who's land we sort of abut, and you know, funding from the council to fence areas of the beach. You know, simple rope fences a lot of the time, just so people don't go and tread on the nest, because a lot of nests get trodden on. And talking to people about, in, on this occasion, dogs. And, you know, if you keep your dog on a lead when you're going past the nest, that gives the birds a much better chance of survival. If you could do that, that would be brilliant. And it's working. There's been a fourfold increase in the number of ring plover chicks fledged off that stretch of beach in three years. So it's easy to get pessimistic when you're talking about nature conservation because there's a lot going wrong in the world. But there's an example of a community of volunteers, some of whom are dogs. We have dog volunteers coming together to talk to people to say if you were to do this that improves that bird there's chances of getting its young fledged and that's an example of where you can work with people and we're going to have to do lots and lots of that you know so we've got a paddleboard it's great but suddenly people are exploring tidal creeks that nobody would have gone up 10 years ago and that has an impact obviously it has an impact so what are those conversations going to look like? And when's it a good idea to go up that creek? And when isn't it a good idea to go up that creek? And who's going to be able to tell you what to do or not to do or ask you? Or Ugh. So it's a constant conversation. And what I like about the Norfolk coast is that people come together and talk. So, you know, you and I are talking. I work for a conservation organisation. You're a private businessman. Uh, I was out with a farmer, company, a friend of ours, David Lyle, earlier this week, having a conversation about farming and nature. Uh, I was out with one of the big estate uh, owners just before Christmas talking. We're on exactly the same page. Yeah. And it's that, that yeah. Joe Cox saying, isn't it, more in common. Um, I think by and large, the people that live and work here, when you actually sit down and work out what you all want, there's quite a lot of overlap. There are areas where you're going to disagree. But by and large, when you talk to people, it, it kind of, you work your way through it normally. <laughs> What's coming up in the calendar for, for the RSPB over the next uh, little while? This is my cue, isn't it, for Big Garden Birdwatch? Absolutely Very perfect. Fun. You see, you remembered. That's why I'm here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that was the um, that was what you asked. Um, so Big Garden Birdwatch, which I would, if you haven't heard about the World Heritage nomination, then you will have heard about uh, Big Garden Birdwatch. It's been running for over 40 years. Last year, half a million people took part. This year, as ever, it's the last weekend in January. So it's Friday the 26th, Saturday the 27th, Sunday the 28th. And we asked people to spend an hour counting birds in their garden. And because some people don't have gardens, you can sit on a bench in the park and count the birds from that bench. You can go to a friend's house. If there's a cafe that's got a garden, you could sit there. You can come and sit got... on our campsite and you know, you with it, with it, bring your motor the... home and sit there and count birds there. Exactly. You could get a coffee from the cafe and you could sit somewhere. There's loads of sparrows around your, your, your yard. That'd be brilliant. And you count the maximum of each species you see you see at any one point in time. So it's not a cumulative total. Uh, so the most sparrows you count in the farmyard is 20. You put that down and they need to land. You can't be counting the stuff flying over. Um, 
And that's it. And you submit it ideally online. You can send a paper copy in. If you register in advance and 200,000 people have already registered in advance, you get access to a digital guide to the birds in your garden. Or you can download and print that if you feel that you need to. Uh, and we're giving away at the minute if you register a 15% discount on food and free delivery. So it's um, a way of encouraging folk to take part. So it's been going for over 40 years and it's it's what's called citizen science. It's it's very broad and shallow in the sense that an awful lot of people spend a little bit of time gathering a small amount of data. But because there's so many people, half a million people doing it, and because it's been going on for so long, it's a really useful data set. Yeah. So we know that House Bow has been top of the pops in the UK for the last 20 years in Big Garden Birdwatch. In Norfolk last year, it was blue tip. Uh, but we also know from Big Garden Birdwatch and other surveys that house bower numbers have plummeted. So it gives you that sense of what's going on. And for me, it's it's great to spend time. You know, all, when I read definitions of well-being, it says, oh, go out in nature and sit still and observe things and be calm and quiet. Well, that sounds like bird watching to me. And actually to sit down and be calm and to observe nature. And you might want to do it again and again because it calms you and centers you. But also my challenge to people that do it is to think, what well, is to think like a bird? So if you've been looking at your garden, there's nothing in it. And you spent an hour looking at it and you've had two birds turn up. Well, you've got to ask the question, why? You know, have you just laid a plastic lawn? Because if you have, that might have an awful lot to do with it. If you've just put concrete over your patio, you know, if you want to think like a blackbird, they need soil. But it might seem obvious, but if you've got nowhere to eat and you've got nowhere to sleep, well, you're not going to hang around, are you? And for me, you know, if you, you do big garden bird watching, I'd like a few more birds in my garden. There's loads of stuff you can do. You can plant some shrubs. You can put a pond in. You can pull up some of the concrete or the plastic that you've put down. Uh, you can leave a compost heap in the corner. You can feed and feed the birds as long as you keep the feeding station clean. You can do all sorts of things that will make your little place better. And if you talk to your neighbours, they might do the same. Yeah. And, you know, so it can become a community thing as well and you do that just bringing it back to you since your podcast you do that deep now you know you've got your um your cover crops in and you know uh, seed crops that you put growing to provide food for birds in that wider landscape and it's exactly the same principle you know the linnet flocks that you get at deep now wouldn't be there if there weren't seeds for them to feed on because that's what they eat and if you don't provide them with what they eat they won't won't hang around and you're part of a, again, deep down sits on the North Norfolk coast. You're surrounded by like-minded landowners who are in their own ways doing doing stuff for nature. So whether that's Wild Ken Hill, the other side of Hunstanton, who are going a long way down that route. Holcomb are doing some amazing things. And of course, we've now got the landscape recovery schemes coming through. So they were, there's the North Norfolk landscape recovery scheme where a bunch of landowners have come together to try and improve their land for nature. There's recently announced that there's one in West Norfolk left by Sandringham and Ken Hill that's going to be doing more work over that side of the coast. So actually, you've already got a high quality nature rich environment and the landowners are wanting to come together to do more for nature in that environment. There's all sorts of drivers for that. You'd have to ask each of them why they've joined in, but it, some will want to do it because they want to do the right thing. Some will see it as a sensible business decision. And there'll be a continuum in between. But, you know, at the end, if the end result is a higher quality landscape that's more resilient to climate change, it does for us like managing water and carbon sequestration. And, you know, the, we had the, the fires two summers ago. You know, if you've got more wet in the landscape, you, you help to reduce the risk of those, etc. That's all got to be a good thing. That's all how we're going to need to manage the landscape going forward. It is lovely when you see the interconnectivity and you see how the impact, the, the massive positive impact that interconnectivity has and uh, and cooperative working is just just wonderful. If you want to know more about Big Garden Birdwatch, just stick RSPB Big Garden Birdwatch into your search engine of choice and it will take you to the page and you can register and find out more about what to do. It, it's worth doing. It's, if nothing else, it's used to go to the bakers, get a cake and a coffee and sit and say you're doing something useful uh, whilst eating cake and coffee. So um, take part. Well, really lovely to chat with you, Steve. Thank you so much. No worries. Hi, everyone. Happy New Year. Welcome to another episode where we talk about the nature of the Norfolk coast for the Deepdale podcast. My name is Ollie from the One Stop Nature Shop. 
and here's a roundup of what can be seen on the Norfolk coast in January. So we're now having a bit of a cold snap after a lot of wet weather during November and December. That doesn't mean that the birds are put off or there's any lack of them. We can obviously see thousands or tens of thousands of pink-footed geese flying over Dalegate Market and Burnham Deepdale every evening and also in the morning as well. While along the coast there's been sightings of velvet scoters, snow buntings, black-throated divers, uh, short-eared owls, a number of different things can be found at this time of year. Um, the sort of tradition or belief that winter is a quiet time is certainly not the case on our coastline. Obviously it's very important as well that you keep feeding your birds at this time of year. They are really in need of um, assistance, especially in, in these cold snaps. And keep an eye on your garden for species like cold tits, bramblings, bullfinches, which all should be visiting gardens much more regularly as it gets colder. Um, other than that, it's a question now of waiting for spring to arrive. We'll start to see some of the wintering species leaving us in the next few weeks as we approach sort of the end of February. But I'll have uh, another update for you hopefully in February where we can talk about what you can look out for on the coast during that month. But that's it for now. Uh, if you need any more information or you want to pop into our shop and have a look at what we have to offer, we're open 9.30 to 4.30 every day until the 1st of February. Thank you for listening and hopefully we'll see you soon. A huge thank you for listening to this month's Deepdale podcast. I'm Jason and I had the pleasure of chatting with Richard Powell, OBE, a wildlife advisor, and Steve Rowland of the RSPB. A big thank you for the wildlife update from Ollie of One Stop Nature Shop. If you have the time, then please do leave a review for Deepdale Podcast on your podcast app or directory, and please do let friends know about this little slice of North Norfolk life. Hope 2024 goes superbly for you, wherever you are in the world. Hopefully we'll see you this year, maybe taking advantage of our midweek three for two offer this winter, or for a weekend away from the big city to enjoy the wildlife and pubs here on the beautiful North Norfolk coast. See you soon. Skies all open wide, geese go high and over. Oh, now you're a beach coma, fist full of sand for sea.